I don't talk about it too often these days, but in a previous life I used to be a promising linguist, doing research in psycholinguistics and being interested in language change. It is a complex issue, but in all honesty, not as complex as life and the universe. So we can use language and its mechanisms as a window to how patterns operate and what rules they follow on other, higher levels of the fractal cosmic symbolic structure. For decades, researchers have been arguing whether language originates more in a top-down or bottom-up manner. Those more sympathetic to the generativist theory coming from Noam Chomsky believe in the existence of a hypothetical language organ, a universal grammar, a principle behind ordering sounds, words and phrases the way we do, common to, broadly speaking, all humans. However, with massive advancements in cognitive sciences, a whole host of researchers started to claim that language generation is not unlike our other cognitive faculties and its efficiency and complexity can very well be achieved by building up from the bottom without resorting to an overarching principle. The philosophical and existential consequences of each of these approaches are dire, but their truthfulness remains unresolved as each of them have really solid evidence to base their, their claims on. What everyone seems to agree on, however, is that language is a hierarchy with a number of levels of organization, where things are ordered from smaller parts to carry more and more meaning on every higher tier. And also that this hierarchy of language has a certain level of stability necessary for successful communication between individuals. That is, its usefulness, but also a potential for flexibility in order to withstand the threats of passing time and changing reality. If language is such a stable system that it gives you ready-made formulaic phrases for familiar events, but allows you also to generate a rule-based original sentence for an unexpected situation, then why is it still subject to change? This is the question I wish to explore in my doctorate but then came across this one book that, although it is hardly academic, as it is devoid of long lists of references, in a stroke of its own genius, answered all the questions I had about this topic. To the extent that I became disinterested in further pursuit of an academic career. That book was Guy Deutscher's The Unfolding of Language. Beloved man, know that this is the truth. The world is in haste, and it approaches its end, and therefore, always in the world, the longer it is, the worse it gets. You see, everyone who looks at the patterns in the world quite quickly reaches the overwhelming feeling that it is coming to an end. Our lifetime is more than enough to notice how the once fallen reality keeps falling further and further away from the grace of Eden. The incessant force of entropy keeps reducing every hierarchy to the leveled chaotic blob of everything mixed with everything. But this sense of doom has been with us for millennia, as we can see in this quote from Wolfston, the Archbishop of York from 11th century, used by Deutscher at the beginning of the third chapter, The Forces of Destruction but it also teaches us about the first always operating principle in language, but also probably everywhere else. Everything withers, decays, degenerates and erodes, both in meaning and form. With frequent use, although this is not a purely frequency-based mechanical process, a given unit of meaning bleaches, becomes as if too familiar, too common, so we start being less attentive to it and produce it faster without much emphasis. That's economy 101. Save your precious currency for where it's needed the most, the new and the unfamiliar, while you withdraw it from the common established ground you have with the person you're communicating with. But you see, this economical attitude has its side effects resonating across both heaven and earth 
meaning and body. The given word, phrase or sentence begins to lose its expressive power, its effect, the load it conveys, lessens. It stops being as meaningful to us as the first time we heard it. Imagine someone being genuinely shocked and rethinking their dietary habits after hearing that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and you'll know what I mean. At the same time, similar things start to happen to the body of that unit. Words shorten and sometimes glue to each other. Some syllables are dropped altogether and the inner structure of that unit becomes less transparent. In this way, all of you can turn into you all and then into y'all. Y'all is a neat example, we'll come back to it later. So far, we've dealt with the destructive force of economy of language, but even though we always feel that it is in decline, as everything in the world, the hierarchy of language not only keeps existing, but it also still serves its basic function. That is because each living hierarchy has enough fresh water cleansing it so that it can maintain fulfilling its function. And the function of language is to bring forth symbols, that is, to express meaning with the use of earthly material, of consonants and vowels. When the expressive capacity of a given linguistic unit erodes due to its popularity, something needs to be done to let more meaning be expressed again. We could say that we are dealing with a situation of, of excessive spirit, that is, the meaning that wants to be expressed, versus a shortage of body, an eroded word or, or phrase. The obvious solution to that is, of course, more body. Even though the word facts already contains the aspect of truthfulness in itself, it has been so abused in the public discourse that now you have to say true facts to maintain the original expressive power. We can also come back to our y'all example and see that the same mechanism as the word you can of course be plural, but it turned out to be lacking in expressive power to convey all of you, not just you. So something had to be added. Both of the forces we've talked so far are connected to time and chaos. We see that a hierarchy subject to time cannot maintain its stability by being unchanging. Rather, parts of it are always subject to destruction and reformulation, often being a side effect of the very same destruction, or entropy, we could say. It needs to be noted, however, that this reformulation happens only because there is a meaning Logos, that seeks being expressed in a new way if the old one isn't sufficient anymore. If there wasn't a meaning looking for a body to bring forth a symbol, language would erode to death thousands of years ago. I'll let you extrapolate this idea to higher hierarchies, even the universe itself, and tell me your convictions about the existence of the eternal Logos. The third and final force behind linguistic change comes from the domain of order and lets the hierarchy remain coherent, namely regularization. If a part of language undergoes erosion and reformulation after a period of chaotic flux, when the borders are blurry and it is not easy to say, for example, if the given unit is two words or one word already, it needs to be reintegrated back into the hierarchy to function as its part, subordinate to higher levels of organization, like clauses, sentences, speeches or essays. In short, to belong to the hierarchy of language, you need to obey its rules. Let's take y'all again. After inflating you with the marker of plurality and a period of erosion into its current form, it is now being reintegrated back into the system as a mere pronoun. I've heard my friend Mary adding a possessive to it many times already. Y'all strain, y'all strings, and so on. If it gains enough momentum, then maybe the English language 
will officially have a new pronoun for the second person plural. There will be a change, but the order will be kept. I really enjoyed Deutscher's book, and it answered so many of my questions. It presents so fantastically how languages were able to evolve and grow to such level of complexity. If you're interested in language, it's definitely worth a read. But I wonder how you find these three basic forces, that is, erosion, the will to express, and regularization, working together on language change. Do you think they might be more universal and explain how other hierarchies undergo changes while preserving stability? Could you think for a while and share if you notice them at work in another domain? Please let me know in the comments and until next time.